Anyway, all right. I'm ready to get into the Word of God. Thank you for being here. We are continuing in our Romans series. We've been in Romans for a while now. This is week 13 in the book of Romans, and I love that you're eating it up. I'm eating it up too. Um, We've been in Romans chapter 12 now for the last couple weeks. This is our third and final week in that particular chapter. And just to recap, I had told you that um, in Romans 12, my opinion, of course, it's one of the most important chapters in the Bible when it comes to good old-fashioned, how do I live as a Christian? How do I live this faith thing out, right? What's, what's my job, if you will? And so last week, we covered gifts of grace, and we covered that everybody is given a spiritual gift. Sometimes it takes a while to figure that out. Sometimes it's multiple ones. Sometimes it's God reveals different ones at different seasons of your life. He doesn't always tell you everything the minute you get saved, you know? And so we covered that. The week before that, we covered the idea of not being conformed to the world, but being transformed by the renewing of your mind. And, and we, we challenged you with the question, are you conformed or transformed on a daily basis? Which is it? What, what am I running after? Well, today, it wouldn't be fitting to wrap up chapter 12 without going after what Paul the Apostle goes after here, and that is simply love. We're going to go after love today in, in this last part of Romans 12. And um, there are 16 chapters in Romans, so we are getting close, but we got a few more weeks yet. And we're going to talk about love, and just to remind you a couple things about love for a moment here. Um, all through Scripture, we see that love trumps everything else. I, I like to play euchre. Any euchre players in the room? And I got to play euchre a couple weeks ago at the, the uh, event that Becky put on over there across the street, and both times I was on a winning team, but I don't like to brag. Uh, <laughs> My partner in one game was Daniel Maynard, and we dominated together, didn't we, Daniel? Praise God. And then I was, was it you and I, Mary? Yeah, so, and we won too, so you're going to want to be on my team. I'm just kidding. <laughs> now, no, I, I probably got lucky, but anyway, the, the reason I bring up Euchre is because, man, if you got that jack, right? If you got that jack, doesn't it trump everything else? And so, love trumps everything. If there's, if there's only one thing, and I hope you get more than one thing right, but if you get one thing right in, in our walk with God, man, we, we err on the side of love. If you don't know how to handle something in your marriage, can I make a suggestion? Err on the side of love. You know, nobody ever loves somebody in a situation and then says, man, why did I have to love them? You know, we don't ever regret showing love. And so we're going to go after that. In Colossians chapter 3, for example, he gives us this list to clothe ourselves. And he says, clothe yourself with kindness, compassion, humility, meekness. But above all this, clothe yourself with love. It's the trump card. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, he says, now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. There it is, trumping again, right? And then it tells us in 1 Corinthians 13, love never fails. That means you're never going to regret showing love. When Jesus was asked by his disciples, what is the greatest commandment? Give it to me straight. Give me the bottom line. What's the greatest commandment out of all these things we could do? And he says, love, your, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. So I was setting the table today by saying, man, you just, you can't go wrong with love. And so in 1 Corinthians 13, we get a definition of what love is. But in Romans 12, this last portion of Romans 12, we're going to read about love lived out, love in action. What does it look like? We can define it, and sometimes we don't always know what love is in action. And what Paul does in this portion of Scripture is he kind of weaves in and out, talking about love for God and love for people. So you might read one verse that applies to how we show our love to God, and then the very next verse, we're flipping over to how we show our love to people, then we're back on God again. And so we'll look at that together and go on this little love tour if you will, as opposed to a love shack, which was a song from my, ch from my teenage years. And what's that? Big 52s, that's it. All right, so starting in verse nine, let's get into this. It says, let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Let's start right there. One of the ways we show our love for God, because don't we say it all the time, man, I love God. I love God, God, I love you, right? We declare to him our love. One of the ways he says we love him as far as in action is we abhor what is evil. What does abhor mean? It means it's like you just, it's disgusted you. I, 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 it's detestable to me what's evil. And he says, abhor what is evil and hold fast to what is good. So like as, as we examine our day, one of the things that I think about, sometimes if we're gonna be honest, 
we get tempted to flirt with evil a little bit. Like, I don't want to actually do the sin, but I want to flirt with it a little bit. I want to th- contemplate it. I, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm thinking about it, you know, and the Lord is saying, look, hate what's evil. Hate the things that God hates. You know, you know how he knows he's got a man or woman after his heart is what God hates, we hate. What God loves, we love. The way he says, man, abhor what is evil. Make it detestable to you. Like, like don't even give place for it in your life. And he says, hold fast to what is good. Don't you love being around good old-fashioned good people? Now, I know nobody's good but God, and I get all that, but what I'm talking about is just people that they just they want to do the right thing. You can always count on them at the end of the day for saying, you know, I want to do the right thing here. Just hold fast to what's good. You know, God defines all through Scripture what is good. And he's saying, hold fast to it, man. Don't, don't let that get, get old. So right off the bat, there's a verse for us about one of the ways we show God our love is, man, we, we hold fast to what's good, and we hate what he hates. And, and if you're tempted to do something and you know that little voice in you says, this is wicked, man, this isn't God. Man, don't, don't play with it. Don't think about it. Don't say, well, I don't know because I'm really going to feel good to my flesh right now. Man, just settle it. Like, be quick to settle it every day. I'm going to hate what God hates today. I'm going to abhor, as the word of God says, what is evil. Verse 10. Now we're going to talk about loving people for a moment. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. I love that verse. Now, you know me, I'm always talking about encouraging people and don't hold back compliments and all that kind of stuff. If you got a kind thing to say to somebody, say it, don't hold back. But but here's something, I don't know if you've ever realized this, maybe you've been guilty of this, I have. I've been guilty of this. I've been on both sides of what I'm about to say. But you may not even realize this, but in your life right now, there are people who are secretly competing with you in your life. Did you know that? Did you know there's people competing with you? There are people who want to outdo you somehow in whatever the thing might be. They're competing with you and with how much money you make, or maybe they're competing with you in, 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 a, in a job. It's a coworker, and little do you know that secretly they want to, they want to outdo you. They want to be seen, and, and I mean, you, you name it, it can be anything. But a lot of people go through life sometimes competing with other people. They want to be the best. They have a hard time somebody, seeing somebody else excel at something that they are passionate about, and, and they secretly compete. And uh, so the last thing they're going to do is honor somebody by saying something great about, like, great job, or you're doing great, or look at you, you know, whatever it might be, because suddenly that makes them feel less. But you know, what, you know how one of the ways we love people with action is we outdo them by honoring them, saying that kind thing, man, giving that compliment. And I know it, you know, you want, you want to hurt the pride in your life? One of the greatest sins we battle with is pride. Pride is at the root of so many sins. You know how you kind of, you put like, you just destroy pride? Go to somebody and honor them, especially if it's something that you're really good at. You know, like for example, if I, if I want to kill pride in my life, if I see a, a clarinet player, it's nothing for me to say, hey man, you are awesome at the clarinet. But if it's a guitar player, now it's personal because there's a secret, like, feel this competition, you know what I mean? And uh, Zach Titcom used to go to this church. He still, still pops in here. And I used to give him guitar lessons for four years, but I had to stop. You want to know why I had to stop? Have you heard Zach play? He was getting too good. And uh, sure, it was an accident when I tripped him and he broke his hand. That was a total accident. <laughs> no, that did not happen. But... Uh, but I'd have to sit there and, and I'd have to stab my pride a little bit when I'd ever go up and say, Zach, man, you sound awesome. And, you know, you might say, well, that's a simple thing. But see, in life, we often compete. People want to, you know, you just name it. It's, it's easy. You know, we, we want to keep up with the Joneses. There's this attitude. But the Bible says, outdo one another in showing honor. You know how you show honor? You value someone. Sometimes it's just a kind word. It's just going out of your way to lift somebody up. And he says, outdo them. That's one competition you can have with people. That's where he gives us, he says, compete with people and out blessing them. If you think it, say it. And we can all find something nice to say. Like even me, you could give me a compliment for singing if you wanted to. You could say, it was so nice when you stopped singing. You know, there's always ways, <laughs> always ways to give compliments. My wife gives me that one a lot. Oh, honey, it's so great you stopped. Thank you. So let's move on. And then it goes on to say, uh, do not be slothful in zeal, but be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord. Now, he says, don't be slothful in zeal. What is zeal? 
Good old-fashioned zeal is that excitement that you have every day for God. And I kind of think of it like when you're a new Christian, we all can remember probably when you were brand new in the Lord. When I was brand new in the Lord, it's like everything I was seeing for the first time. It was so exciting. I think of a baby. When a baby is born, everything they look at is new, right? So you, when, the first time a baby sees a Christmas tree, you know, it's like they just light up because they're seeing it new. But what happens after they've seen the Christmas tree a while? Not as exciting anymore. What happens when you've been looking at Christmas trees for 47 years if you're that young? Um, you know, it's, uh, it gets old after a while if you're not careful. So he says, don't get slothful in zeal. That means don't lose the excitement for God. God is blessed by your zeal. God is blessed by your excitement for him, your passion for him. Don't lose that. Don't lose that. It's easy for God to become commonplace if you're not careful. It's easy to be like, I'm just a Christian, you know, just doing what I do. Man, no, listen, he says, don't get slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. That means, man, like, like get a hold of yourself daily. Sometimes your flesh just has to get kicked and say, listen, stop being down all the time. I serve the most awesome God. He saved me. I got a seat in heaven waiting for me. I got a God I can call on any time. I know he hears me. I know he cares. I know he's at work. And he says he works all things for good to those who love him. And I know that I love him. So I know that this trial that I'm in that doesn't make sense is going to be used for good. So I can rest in that. And I'm going to get myself built up. When I pray, man, I love to get myself excited in the Lord. I preach to myself. I say, come on, Paul, I pray and I preach to myself, and then I take a love offering. <laughs> but that doesn't make sense. So anyway, um, so don't be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Now listen, this next verse, verse 12. I was just reading this this morning, and, and it just kind of hit me. If you're in a trial right now of any kind, you're in a physical trial. You're in a relational trial. You're in a financial trial. You're in just a, maybe you're in a funk. You're depressed. You're, you're anxious. You're, you're going through something, right? And if you are, I can relate to you. Here is a beautiful thing we can do to honor God in our trial. How many of you want to honor God right in the middle of your trial, of your difficulty? I do too. So listen to verse 12. It says three things we can do right here, guys. Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, and be constant in prayer. Think about that for a second. Rejoice in hope. That, that's where I kind of just got done saying. It's like, Lord, this doesn't make sense, but I'm going to choose to be hopeful here because I know you're going to do something good. I mean, I can, I can look back on so many trials throughout my life and see how God used it for good and the very thing that I wished he would have never did to me, like, God, how you, how, why are you allowing this I look back and say, man, thank you for doing that because I'm different today because you allowed that, right? Many, many things. So rejoice in hope. It's a faith thing to rejoice right in the middle of what you don't understand. But, but you know what that does to God? It really honors him. It really blesses him. It touches God when you say, God, you're good, even though I don't get this, man. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. That's tough, man. Anybody can handle tribulation for a half hour or when you know it's going to be over like soon. This is a bad day, but tomorrow's going to be better. But sometimes you're in a tribulation, a trial. Man, you don't know when it's going to be over. You don't know when you're going to get off that ride. He says, be patient. I don't waste your pain. Isn't that cool with God? You don't waste your pain. God doesn't waste anything that you go through. He doesn't waste it. He doesn't mess with you. He doesn't get any joy in just messing with his people. Everything's for a purpose. So be patient in tribulation. And then here's one, my friends, that changes everything. Be constant in prayer. I know we can't always sit there every second of every day being in this prayer posture. Dear Heavenly Father, you know, kind of got to work, kind of got to like live, you know, do things. But as you're doing those things, the Bible says be constant in prayer. Constantly be in this attitude of prayer. You ever done that, man? You're talking to somebody, but under your breath you're praying. I do that a lot. I'm talking to somebody. I'm like, Lord, quicken this to me. Should I say this? Lord, what do you think about that? Lord, look at that person's outfit. Look at that person's new glasses. I like them better than mine. Should I take them? <laughs> anyway, stuff like that, you know. Always praying. Sorry, I saw someone's glasses and they distracted me because they're nice to mine. And uh, so I can't, but I have to force myself to honor them and say nice glasses and, 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 and outdo them in honor. 
But no, I mean, seriously, be constant in prayer all through the day. Don't just pray at your meal. Don't just pray at bedtime. Then be constantly talking to God. It gives you so much peace. And here's the cool thing, man. I don't care what you're going through. I mean, I care. But when you're praying to God in the middle of it, it's like, it's like Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, man. They're in a fire, but God's with them. Take God into your trial. Talk to him. Be constant in prayer. I'm telling you, it blesses him. And you can't bless God without being blessed. You can't bless God without you benefiting from it. And whatever you do for God comes back to you. And I've given this example 47 times probably. But I'm going to say it one more time for those who've never heard it. You know how that works? It's like being on a hot roof in the middle of summer doing a roofing job and it's 90 degrees out and you take a cold glass of water and you dump it on your head, your whole body will be refreshed. Because what you do to the head refreshes the body. When you refresh God by blessing him, by praying to him, your body is refreshed. You are refreshed, my friends. And then he goes on. Now we're back to people again. Verse 13, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. There's always needs around us. Always somebody you can bless. Always somebody in need. You can't get around them. But the Lord says, contribute to the needs of the saints. That's the other believers. And seek to show hospitality. Have people over. It's just simple stuff. You know, when we open that other side, it's going to be so nice. We're going to have a nice coffee bar over there where you can sit and have fellowship. Right, Greg? Right now, it's kind of hard. You get out of this service, I kind of need you to leave because... I need other people to come in for second service. I mean, I don't care if you hang out in the hallway or even hang out here, but, but now we'll have a place where we can actually say, listen, you guys want to continue your, your conversation? Show hospitality. Get to know each other. Go sit in there and hang out and have a cup of coffee and whatever other pastry we might have that day and, and, and get to know people and just show good old-fashioned hospitality. It's, it's a way we put love in action. It's a way we put love in action. Now, it gets a little tougher. Verse 14, staying on people for a moment here. He says, bless those who persecute you. Hmm. Now that's a tough one, isn't it? Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Did you catch something in that verse? He says the word bless twice. Just because I believe he doesn't want you to miss it. I mean, check that out. Bless those who persecute you. And then he says, bless, says it again, and do not curse them. You know why he says that, I believe? Because doesn't it feel good to curse those who curse you? Doesn't it feel good when somebody's nasty to you to one-up it and be nasty to them? It feels good. It really does. It feels good to the flesh. Oh, they did that? Oh, boy. Well, they're going to get this. They said that to me. I'm going to say this to them. That's the, that's the American way, man. Nobody watches a movie if at the end of the movie there's not going to be good old-fashioned justice for the bad guy. Here, I'm a Christian, but I don't know how many times I've watched movies. I'm like, oh, boy, here comes the revenge. Been waiting for this part. Kill him. You know, he's like, oh, don't drop the knife. Never mind. I'm a bad person. But anyway, uh, I'm just showing too much of me. I, I find myself in movies getting disappointed sometimes, and he goes, you're not worth it. Isn't that the big line in all the movies? You're not even worth it. And he drops the weapon. I'm like, he's worth it. Take him out. <laughs> and I was like, sorry, God, you know, in real life now, I wouldn't do that. But, and I like my entertainment nice and sinful, apparently. But, um, but what does the Bible actually say we're supposed to do? Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Now we're acting like Christians. We do that. Now you start to resemble Jesus when you do that. We might not have people literally persecuting us the way that we see in the Middle East in many places right now, but persecution comes in many waves and many, it looks many different ways, but the answer is still the same. Bless those that are nasty to you. Bless them. It's real simple. It makes life a lot easier. Do you know it takes way more energy to be negative to people? It takes way more energy to be angry and insult people than it does to love them and bless them? It really does. You're spending so much more energy when you're cursing folks. And then verse 15, we're still on people. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. There's an art to that, folks. There's an art to that. One of the ways you can really put your love in action is if somebody's sorrowful, weep with them. Even if you can't literally cry, just be there with them in their moment. You know, I, uh, 
an example of that. You know, somebody, if you just got a raise, but somebody comes to you and says, man, I just, I just lost my job. I was blindsided. That's not the time to say, really? I just got a raise. That's great you got a raise, but at that moment, that's not what they need to hear, you know? And just, just weep with them in that moment. Some of us, we, we, got, we can't be selfish, you know? Like, be sensitive to the need of the person. You know, my dad one time, he's a character. I, uh, I, my jaw drops. Sometimes I just never, I think, Lord, I'm going to be like this when I'm older, aren't I? You know, and, and I love my dad. I'm, I mean, I really do. He's an awesome guy. But sometimes he will just say things that make me just shake my head. It's like, what? And we were in Tennessee visiting my sister a few years back. And my aunt, who lost her husband several years back, was just venting to us. It was Thanksgiving, and I think she was just being in an emotional place, you know. And and she starts saying to all of us around this kitchen table, boy, I sure miss my husband, which is my dad's brother. And she's crying. My dad reaches out, puts his hand on her forearm, and says, Rita, I know just what you're going through. And I'm like, wow, dad's really ministering here. I'm just going to watch him, you know. And pour in some kind words, because you see, my mom died eight years ago, so I figured what would be the natural thing you would say, I understand what you're going through, you know, I lost my wife, and you know, I just was waiting for this tender moment to happen, you see, and, uh, but instead, <laughs> my dad puts his hand on her arm and says, I know just what you're going through. Last week, somebody hit my mailbox post and knocked it right out of the ground. <laughs> She just kind of looked at him. I'm like, wow, Dad, we don't go to play the mom card there. We, we do the mailbox post. Okay. I don't know that that comforted much. At least he didn't cry. I love that mailbox post. You know? it, it didn't go that far. But one of the ways we show love in action is, is you know, and, and here's the thing. I'm going to let you off the hook. Do you know that sometimes and most of the times less is more? You know, when you're dealing with people that are losing a loved one or have lost a loved one or are going through a heartbreaking time, it's really not what you say. There's never really the right word to say. There's nothing you're going to really say at that moment that they say, oh, oh I feel great now. Woo, I'm happy. No, when they're hurting, they're hurting. But you know what? One of the biggest things you can do is, is be there. Don't say anything. A lot of times, man, you know, we, we, the biggest ministry is just your presence, you know, sometimes there is nothing to say. There's no words sometimes, you know? And oftentimes when we do try to say something, afterward we think, oh, why did I say that? I'm sorry for your loss. I love you and I'm here. That is some of the greatest ministry right there. And anybody can do that. But on the other side, rejoice with those who rejoice too. You know, don't hold back your rejoicing because you're jealous. When am I going to get that? I want that. Why, why did he get that? I can't be happy for him. No, listen, God will do your thing when you're, it's your time, whatever that thing is, right? And so cheer up and rejoice for the person who's celebrating. That's love in action. Love in action is, is being what that person needs at that moment. And in verse 16, live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Live in harmony with one another. Go out of your way to be at peace with people. That's love, my friends. Harmony. Just be in harmony. It's not worth it to stir it up. I had a friend one time, he just, I think he just loved conflict. Loved it. And you could give him a compliment. I used to, I used to say to him, bro, I said, you're the only guy I know that will make an argument even when somebody compliments you. He was like, you just want to not be in harmony. You want to disrupt everything all the time. But that's not love. Love is just going out of your way to live in harmony with people. Be kind. And it says, do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. So the youth group, uh, was it two weeks ago, our, or one week ago, two weeks ago, our youth group watched a movie called Not Ashamed. It's a very intense movie. And, and uh, a lot of you, there was about 25 kids there. So a lot of you are in this room. And it was, it was an amazing movie about a teenage girl uh, in, a, in the middle of a school shooting who was, who was shot and killed because of her stance for God. An amazing young woman, you know, and it was, it was the Columbine, uh, the story of the Columbine shooting, and just, it, was, it was just highlighting what kind of a girl she was before that day, and she was on fire for God. And you know what stood out to me the most about this young lady? It wasn't even that she gave her life at the end, which was amazing, but I loved how she went after the lowly in her school. 
I love how she would try to hang out with people that everybody else thought was nerdy or just not worth the time of day. That's a beautiful thing. When you go after the one that nobody else is going after, you know what you, know what you call that? You call that looking like Jesus. Go after the lowly, man. Don't, don't hide from the one that, you know, especially in high school, I know there's a lot of peer pressure for that, who you hang out with, what table you sit at. We can get hung up on stupid things, you know, especially that peer pressure age. But man, I'm telling you, if you want to look like Jesus, he says, associate with the lowly. And he goes on to say, never be wise in your own sight. You know, I know we always think we got the right answer. You know, you know how you can tell a person who's really maturing? They don't have to be right all the time. See, I don't have a choice. It's just what happens. I'm just kidding. I don't know if anybody caught that. <laughs> Nobody, okay, never mind. No, I'm usually not right. But um, no, in all honesty, though, like, that's one of the ways you grow up. Can you actually, if somebody says something and inside you say, hmm, you know what, they're right. What are you going to do in that moment? Are you going to say, you know what, now that I think about it, you're right. I'm sorry, I was wrong. Or is it like, no way I'm going to do that. I don't care that they're right. I'm not going to humble myself, you know. But one of the ways you grew up is, man, you're not wise in your own eyes. You're, you're okay with saying, oh, yeah, I was wrong again. You know, it's just, uh, it's a sign of maturity. And then he goes on to say in verse 17, repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to what is honorable in the sight of all. Kind of going back, but he's kind of getting repetitive here now, isn't he? Going back to that don't repay evil for evil thing. He's going back to that bless those that curse you thing. See, this is love in action, my friends. Anybody, and the Bible says this in other places. In Luke 6, it says this. Anybody can be good to those who are good to them. Even the wickedest of the wicked are good to those who are good to them. But you're acting like Jesus when you don't repay evil for evil. I know that's unnatural because someone's evil to you. What are you going to do? I want to be evil to them. Right? You insult me, my insult's coming right back. There's going to be more, more of a sting to it because that's what we do. But that's not who Jesus is. Repay no one evil for evil. And then he says this, and this is like a really good word for us. I mean, it all is, of course, but give thought to what is honorable in the sight of all. God did not put that in his word by accident. Everybody say, in the sight, in the sight. of all. I would have given you the whole sentence. I didn't mean to insult you thinking you couldn't memorize that little extra two words. In the sight of all, people know you're a Christian. Listen to me close now. Chances are, if you're living your faith, people know you're a Christian. That means they're watching how you handle conflict. They're watching when the coworker gets you upset. The coworker just did something that you think is unjust, and now all your coworkers are watching you. What do they see? Do they see a Christian? Or do they see, man, you're just no different than the rest of us. You're going off the handle just like all everybody else. No, man, listen, what, what do they see? He says, because he tells us this, a good name, this is for the Christian now, a good name is rather to be chosen than what? Great riches. That means how you protect your name, your reputation as a Christian is really important. Because if you're going to wear the name Christian and you're going to wear the bumper sticker that says, I love Jesus, and if you're going to have the fish on your car and you're going to wear the T-shirt and, you know, the whole nine yards and go around telling everybody they need Jesus. Man, I see people on Facebook sometimes. Jesus is awesome. I love Jesus. And then the next clip that they put on Facebook is like a curse word and something like, I'm like, wow. Do you not know that 900 of your friends just saw that? <laughs> you know what I mean? Be careful what you do in the sight of all because you are an, an ambassador for Jesus. It sounds real godly to say, I don't care what people think about me. Wrong. <laughs> that's, not, that's not biblical. He says a good name is to be chosen. It's a token to be spent for God's glory. Right? Now, yeah, there's a balance to that. I don't care what people think of me in the sun. I'm not going to be ashamed of the gospel and all that. Yes, that's healthy. But how you behave and how you handle things, and nobody will see your Christianity lived out more than when you are opposed and when somebody comes against you. Are you going to flesh out? Are they going to see a humble person who's been touched by God? That's going to get people's attention. That's going to like say, wow, so this is what a Christian looks like. But as we move on, verse 18, if possible, now that's a big part of this next one, if possible, so far as that depends on you, kind of goes with if possible, live peaceably with all. Much as you can do that. Here's the thing. Sometimes you don't have a choice. 
You've done everything you can to live at peace with somebody, but they just don't like you. And it's just not going to matter. You're not going to be at peace with them. They do not like you. A lot of times it's because you're a Christian and they know what they, do you stand for, that you're going to be people who just oppose you. They don't like you because of what you believe. You used to be this guy. You used to be just like us. Now you're this weird Christian and there's nothing you can do. They're just not going to like you. But as much as it's up to you, you live at peace with them. You don't be the reason that there's not peace in the relationship. You see what I'm saying? You don't be the reason. And that you're not going to believe it. He goes after it a third time. Do you think he's trying to tell us something? He goes after it again. Verse 19. Beloved. See, he says beloved because he's like getting passionate. He's like, guys, hear me now. Listen to me. He's saying beloved. Please lean in and listen to me. That's what Paul the Apostle is saying here. Never avenge yourselves. Paul, you already hit this twice. Why are you doing this again? Are you trying to say we struggle with this? But leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Just for clarity what that means, you're not literally taking hot coals. Like, wow, I can do vengeance. Take that, you know. You know what that means, man? This is, I've seen this played out. I'm sure you've seen this played out. Sometimes people, they just, they're just against you. For no reason, and it's totally not even justified. They just don't like you for whatever reason. Like I said, you're a Christian or whatever. Maybe they just have this thing. And they're expecting you to be nasty. And then all of a sudden, what do you do? You catch them by surprise, and you're good to them. You're really good to them. You're blessing them. You're smiling at them. You see they have a need at work, and instead of just saying, <laughs> look at you struggling, you're helping them. You know, you give them food to the hungry and something to drink for the th- you know, for those who are thirsty, that can look many different ways, right? He says, you reap hop coals upon their head, meaning they sit back and they say this, wow, I'm, I'm almost ashamed. I, I'm, I was wrong about them. They're actually not the person I thought they were at all. That's what we are called to do is, is let them say, wow, I was wrong, as opposed to them saying, yep, see, I knew they were just, they're no different than me. They just did the same thing to me. You know what I mean? But when you, when you, Leave the vengeance up to the Lord. Listen, God, God's going to repay it. He already said he would. He's like, leave the vengeance to me. I got this. You don't have to do my job. My job is the vengeance. But yeah, but God, that's the fun part. It might be fun in the moment, but you know it's not fun after. Vengeance is fun to your flesh at that moment, but nobody feels good after that, especially if you're a believer. So just leave the vengeance to God. And then the last thing he says in this chapter do not overcome, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That's four times, four times in this little portion on love that he's talking about treating somebody better than they deserve. So you want to put love into action today. When it comes to God, obviously hate the things he hates and rejoice in him and trust him and pray to him and be hopeful even when it doesn't make sense. And one of the There's a lot of things we went over that you can do to people, but one of the most redundant ones that came up four times, technically five times, if you want to, I could have divided that verse up even more because it was long. Five times, treat people different than they deserve. There's no room for vengeance in God's kingdom, especially in the body of Christ. Be quick to forgive. That doesn't mean you can't call out sin. That means you can't call out somebody did something mean to you. I'm not saying you you can't. But it's how you do it. And then it's what you do after. You know what I'm saying? It's like, okay, I forgive you. We're going to leave this here. But sometimes you have to confront. That's, there's nothing wrong with that. You have to do it sometimes. The Bible says in Proverbs, however, that it's w- wisdom to be able to overlook an offense. So sometimes you've got to ask yourself, can I overlook this? One of the best things we can do to show love to people is do a little thing called give them the benefit of the doubt. Give the waitress the benefit of the doubt. Maybe she's just having a a bad day. Maybe she's got something going on at home. Show her a little mercy. She didn't mean to burn your toast. She didn't mean to get the order wrong and put the cheese on when there wasn't supposed to be cheese. Give her the benefit of the doubt. 
give that friend of yours the benefit of the doubt when they forgot to wish you happy birthday. You know, I mean, on and on it goes, right? Those little simple acts of kindness are showing the kind of love that Jesus is excited about. So as we wrap up Romans 12 today, my friends, remember, just like in Euchre, the jack always trumps in that suit. Love will always trump. Err on the side of loving people. And you'll act like Jesus. Greatest commandment, love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. And this whole book hangs on that. You get that right, all this other stuff works its way in. Can I get an amen today, ladies and gentlemen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your powerful word, Lord, that just, it just gives us such clear direction, Lord God. And as we just go verse by verse today, Lord, help us to walk in what you tell us to walk in, Lord God. We just need your supernatural strength to do this, especially when it comes to the vengeance part, Lord, and Boy, repaying evil for evil, that just comes so natural to us, Lord God. But Lord, remind us that people are watching and that you are watching and that we are here on assignment. We are ambassadors for you. So Lord, let us live as ambassadors that bring you glory, not totally paint a different picture than who you are. And so we thank you, God. Your word just is so rich and true and we, we just wanna walk in it now. I right, pray this over all of us in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, love you guys. Go get a brown chair. <laughs>